uh, when my husband, when Tom retired from working for Metro Parks, we, we like many other folks, said, well, when we retire, we're going to go be volunteers in the National Parks. So we talked to a friend of ours who um, we had met working with the Wabash Cannibal Trail and the Volunteers Battlefield, uh, an employee of the National Park Service. And he said, Marianne, why don't you get a job for pay as a ranger naturalist with the National Park Service? Oh, sure. Well, next thing you know, I got a job interview and I'm off we pack up the two boys. We're like six and seven years old in a van in our car and we head to Medora, North Dakota, to Theodore Roosevelt National Park, which if you have not been there and you call yourself a conservationist, you need to go. Just to be in the badlands and the hills and the valleys and the buttes where Theodore Roosevelt became a conservationist and an ecologist and all the other wonderful things he was, in addition to the yada, 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 you need to be there. It, it's just um, an experience. It's like, for me, I tell people it's a conservationist mecca. On top of that, um, North Dakota, North Dakota is the least visited of all 50 of the United States. More people go to Hawaii and Alaska than go to North Dakota. You are missing something if you haven't been to North Dakota. It, you, you need to go to North Dakota. It's, it's uh, absolutely well, fabulous. I just saw a lot of Sodak super there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Well, South, South Dakota is so different. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a whole, whole different. Yeah. Whole different. Well, the, wait till you go to North Dakota then. <laughs> wait, if you think South Dakota, just wait till you go to North Dakota. Um, in the, so in addition to working at Theodore Roosevelt National, so working as an interpretive ranger with the National Park Service means I get to wear a flat hat and a badge, and I don't get to wear a gun, but I do get to point my finger at people and tell them what not to do. <laughs> um, so I did that at North Dakota for one summer, and then the summer, and that's where I fell in love with bison. Uh, the next summer, we decided to try something different, so off we go to Acadia National Park, it's in Park over in Maine. Nice place to visit, couldn't afford to live there. Even <laughs> as um, on my park ranger salary, we just barely broke even that summer, just barely. But it was beautiful and I had to walk, I had to hike on the ocean every day. Yeah. Uh -huh. I had to go up mountains and go in tide pools and on boats to places, so it was, it was a rough summer. Um, took a couple summers off because we could not get family housing as park employees. Um, most seasonal housing you have to share with somebody you don't know. But my two autistic, two sons with autism, and my husband and myself, not a good fit. Uh -huh. So um, we had always, of course, everybody wants to work at Yellowstone. So I have a friend who has a friend who has a friend who said, Marianne's applying at Yellowstone, you should hire her. And that's when we got bumped up, the, bumped up the scale and we spent five summers at Yellowstone National Park. It sucks being me. Um, <laughs> I had to go from the oak openings. I had to go bigger. You know, <laughs> I had to go bigger. Um, and Tom has uh, had an uncle who worked in the Gallatin National Forest. So Yellowstone is a square, and up here is Montana in the Gallatin National Forest. And his uncle was the super the superintendent of the National Forest. And Tom always wanted. So we always had people to visit and places to go when we were in Yellowstone. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about specifically Yellowstone. Um, then after that, my sons decided they did not like living someplace where there was no cell phone and no Wi-Fi, no internet. And they decided they put their foot down. They're not going out west anymore. So I worked two summers out at Perry's Victory on the island. And I, at the age of, I don't know, 57, 60, something like that, I was living with two 25-year-old women. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, I was the one. <laughs> and someday I'll tell you about the Smithsonian cocktail contest national winner because of Paris Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so tonight we're going to talk about bison. And I was telling you, oh, say hi to the people on Zoom. People on Zoom, I forgot. Is there a lot of people on Zoom? <laughs> Sorry, people on Zoom. This is going to be me tonight, zooming back and forth and around all the place. So um, I was about to say, there, there's a lectern here, but I can't see over it and you can't see me behind it. So I, and I'm not much of a lectern person anyways. And I decided not to do death by PowerPoint tonight. You're welcome. 
Partly because as a, an interpreter ranger, a ranger with the National Park Service, you're out in places where you don't have things like cell phone power and Wi-Fi and all that. So you've got to come up with other ways to give knowledge without boring your visitors to death. So primarily what I did in Yellowstone was I worked at the Madison, the historic Madison Museum, which is at the confluence of the uh, Gibbon River and the Fire Pole, Fire Pole River. They come together and create the Madison River. Absolutely beautiful location. National Park Mountain is over there, campground here. Um, absolutely a divine place to work, really, really wonderful. So it was also, we called it the Junior Ranger Station at that time. So we did, uh, as a core of rangers, we did 10 individual programs every day geared for kids. So yes, you're getting Junior Ranger programs tonight. <laughs> Some ways it's a little easier than the adult stuff because I'm not gonna bore you with lots of facts and figures, but we are going to see what it is about bison that I love. So I came up with, this is my friend, Oh, very nice. He does have a roll here. So I got my high tech ranger stuff out. And because it's high tech, it's like a slide machine. It's backwards. Put these over here. And that's for later. So here's my high tech slides. Bison top 10 list. Mary Ann's favorite things about bison. However, if you want Mary Ann to talk about bison, you'd be prepared to sit for 10 or 12 hours. So and to get this down to less than an hour, I cut it down to the top seven things or so that I like about us. Number one, or number 10, or number seven, or something. Oh, coolest things about bison. <laughs> number eight, they're really called bison. They're really bison, not buffalo. Tatanka is a better word. That's the Lakota word for bison. Um, they're Bison, 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 if you want to get super technical. They are their own thing. They are not in any way, shape, or form related to the water buffalo that are in Africa. But when the American and other white settlers came to the United States, they went out to here in Ohio and they looked at those giant hump things and said, or if you're French, you say, Nebu. And eventually it got turned into buffalo. That's one interpretation of the story. There are other interpretations of this story from the Lakota and um, some other native tribes who have their own versions of what it should be called. Tatanka is the Lakota word. The Great Plains generally use Tatanka. Uh, bison, bison. Um, they are just super cool. How many of you watched Ken Burns' program a couple of weeks ago? He called it the American Buffalo. <laughs> and the reason he did that, he, he said later, um, and Dayton Duncan, I met Dayton Duncan on some other stuff at Theodore Roosevelt. Um, they said many elders and tribes still call them buffalo. That's just part of their culture. So they call them buffalo. So he decided to call it American buffalo, even though many of us were going all the time. Number seven, they're big, really, really big. I cannot emphasize enough how big a bison is. Really, really big. So if you take a uh, small Ford Ranger pickup truck, park it in your driveway, that takes up about the same amount of space as an American bison, as bison bison does. Easily, a bull can be even nine, ten, nine feet, seven, eight, nine feet at the home. The head, if you stand in front of a bison, the head is about this wide. It's really amazing. Um, a female bison weighs 1,200, 1,500 pounds. A male bison, easily up to 200. Uh, one of the things I got to do at Theodore Roosevelt National Park was participate in a uh, bison roundup. And we got one into the chute that came out at 2,400 pounds. Um, he did not like being in the chute. They let him go immediately because uh, instead of shipping them off to one of the tribes, but he um, so easily 2,400 pounds is not, not out of the realm of possibility. Not at all. Big, really, really big. But you knew that. Um, they're, well, really, really, really speedy. So take that Ford Ranger pickup truck. 
and park it here and say, oh, I'm going to go over there. Put your foot on the gas instantly. Oh, you're off 60 miles per hour. Easy. Easy. This great big dumb looking dude. In an instant, zero to 60 in nanoseconds. They can sustain speeds over long hauls, hundreds of miles for hours and hours of 35 miles an hour. That's, that's amazing. So my question is this, I've got this 2000 pound animal, zero to 60 or zero to 60 in a few seconds, sustained speeds at 35 miles an hour. And it eats the crappiest grass on the Great Plains. Why, <coughs> oh, why can we not make a vehicle and put the crappiest grass in it and run it at 60 miles an hour and 35 miles an hour. We have missed a step in there someplace. We, we've got to think that we need to learn about how to take, convert the crummiest nutrients and turn it into this most amazing critter. Speed. Really fast. Oh, Ranger, we're fine. We can outrun it. <laughs> There's a reason you have to stay 50 yards away. Yeah, so here's the next one. I'm sorry, uh, this was a children's program, I admit, but well, they're horny. Bison are horny. They they have horns, not antlers. Um, constantly, we were asked, when do, the, when do the antlers fall off the bison? Well, they don't, because they're horns. Males and females have them. Both males and females have horns. Some people will try to tell you that girl horns, girls have curls. <laughs> so Tom and I decided that our first summer at Theodore Roosevelt, we decided we'd test that theory. So we went out and drove around, took a picture of every bison head we could see. And that's hundreds and hundreds of bison heads. No, couldn't tell the difference um, based on horns. Sometimes the young males are a little spikier looking. Some populations in some areas, uh, the ones that came from Goodnight's uh, Ranch in Texas, tend to be a little spikier genetically, but you really can't tell much. If you want to tell if you're looking at a boy bison or a girl bison, there's only one way to do it without any certainty, and that's to look at the undercarriage. That's, that's all there is to it. Male bison are bigger. So if you see a herd, you can pick the males out pretty easily because they are a lot bigger. And their robes are just phenomenal. I apologize for not having the robe here. I know you all wanted to play with it. Um, but they're phenomenally heavy. And the shoulder hump has a much heavier fur on it than the, than the sleek rear ends of the, the bison. Movie. Um, females have the capes. It's called the cape. Um, but it's not quite as pronounced as the males. Males have pantaloons on their four legs. Um, which are just baggier blobs of fur. When you look at a picture of bison, you say, oh, she was talking about pantaloons. That's a thing. Um, and, you know, if, if you've got a herd and you're not sure, then if, you, if, you have, if you're not sure what it is, it's probably a female. But when you see a male, you know it's a male bison. There's no doubt about it. And you can't tell that. It's ridiculous. Uh, let's see, coming down the home stretch here. I haven't done this for a while. Oh, well, bison are very useful and tasty. I'm an omnivore. I, I, I like bison. I like cow. I like pigs and chickens and all those things. Um, bison is really lean. <laughs> and for example, if I make a bison uh, meatloaf, for example, I slather it in bacon to make it juicy enough to be palatable to me. So it's, it's very lean stuff. Um, it takes a lot, it cooks faster. I don't know what the chemistry is about that, but bison, if you're making ground beef bison for sloppy joes or something, it's gonna cook a lot faster than, than ground beef is. Um, and I got into trouble, not trouble. I went to the uh, premiere, WDTE had a premiere at the studio before the, the program aired. And they had invited, or somehow or other, a family who's there who owns a bison ranch in, in Swanton, right up north of my house. And the gentleman was talking about it, and he said, so, he said something, and I, I finally said, 
you know those are beefalo. They're not really bison. The only, 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 only purebred bison in the United States are in Yellowstone National Park. Everything else has got some beef in it. It's got some cow in it someplace. For a long time, the whole time till about five or six years ago, Theodore Roosevelt's herd was considered to be purebred 100% bison. Some knucklehead did a test with more DNA studying power and they found cow genes in the Theodore Roosevelt herd. So now we have one herd of purebred bison in the United States. And I have not So if you go to get bison at the store, you're getting beefalo. So I happen to mention that it's just this room full of people and the, the guy says, our bison came from Yellowstone. I said, well, everybody's bison at some point came from Yellowstone. That, that's just the way it is. But along the way, they had company. They met other things out there along the way, um, mostly unintentionally, but you know, it happens. And so apparently, I didn't look this up, but apparently the bison ranching industry has set standards and the standard they chose so promoting weight is that if it's at least 99% genetically bison, you can call it bison. You don't have to admit about that 1%. Oh, it's purebred bison. No, it's not. So it's it's um biologically it's important in terms of going out and enjoying a bison herd or being in a bison jam or dining on bison, it doesn't make any big difference. But just to know that, that that's where the difference between bison and beefalo. Um, other parts of, yeah, sure, go ahead. They were trying to say the herd that didn't they purposefully. They tried. Cattle and cattle. They tried, they tried. Didn't, didn't go very well, but they tried. I just look at it another way. All of us have some percentage, a varying percentage of Neanderthal. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, are we doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and when you start talking about genetics, you're always going to raise questions about, you know, my 30% Scottish is, yeah, you know. Um, so it, it's, a, it's always a question. Um, we more often hear genetic, genetic questions when we be talking about wolves. So one of them probably has a whole other, whole other deal. Um, other, the Native Americans used as all, I'm like, I'm just like preaching to the choir. All of you know that Native Americans used every cotton picking part of the bison. Uh, the scapula, the backbone is big enough to be a shovel or a hoe. Um, one of my ranger partners used to carry a bison femur around after dark in the park because it had a mag light and radio in one hand, bison femur in the other, nobody messed with her. Mm -hmm. Um, the hooves in the, um, uh, Arikara Mandan Hadatsa tribes of North Dakota, they had these ginormous earth lodges and a buffalo robe over the front. And for doorbells, they would take bison hooves and string them together. And when somebody opened the bison robe to come into the earth lodge, you'd hear a clackety, clackety, clack. So you could use, and they make nice little cups. Bison horns, of course, can be used for just about anything you can imagine. You can shave them, you can polish them, you can use them for all sorts of things, spoons, ladles, on and on. Um, my favorite thing, and I'm trying so hard to find a place where I can ethically source bison parts, is the bison bladder, which got used for lots of stuff. If you wanted to keep some something that was special to you, maybe, um, maybe in the native process you would have a letter that came by actual, actual U.S. mail, or the, the government gave you a document that said this was your land. Um, you might put that in a thing called a bar flesh, which is a bladder. It's folded over, decorated, sewed up with a little little button to hold it, uh, hold it tight. Called a bar flesh. You would put documents. You would put things you wanted to keep in your bar flesh. And of course, because the bladder originally held water, the Native Americans used it also to hold water, as we would use a. Uh, what do they call those uh, canteen? What do they call those hydro packs? You know, the swisher hydro packs. You'd have a, a, a bison bladder to, to carry your water on. And just about a sinew, I've got some bison sinew to use for 
for thought, for sewing. You can't drape that stuff. The hive you can use for, you name it. You can just about use a bison hive for anything. One of my favorite uses is Mandan and Rikara, Hadatsa, the three affiliated tribes in North Dakota, would make bull boats out of them. So they'd take diamond willow and craft a round, like, like a giant bowl, yay big, cover the outside with tanned bison hide and float up and down the river on an absolutely uh, waterproof. Um, just absolutely stunning. And it's only about $1,200 if you want to go buy yourself one. Mm -hmm. So if you have made a nice man in swan head. Yes, he would. Okay. He, he, they do sell, I did ask, she is learning to brain tan. The woman who owns it is learning how to brain tan hides nice. instead of chemically do that. And they have, um, they, they will part with other things. I think my, my shot passed, but I might send some friends over to get this. I really kind of. No, I, I don't know. I hope not. They, but I, yeah. And that's and that's um, the National Park Service manages their resources differently than, say, state parks do or the Fish and Wildlife do. And one of the biggest differences is in how Yellowstone National Park or Wind Cave National Park or Theodore Roosevelt National Park manage their herds compared to how, say, how Custer State Park in South Dakota manages their herd. I don't know if they're still doing this, but 12 years ago, if things were dull during the day and the bison were way, way off in the back, staff would go out in jeeps and four-wheelers and push the herd closer to where the people were. Um, they would manage the herd that way. Um, so it was a, um, a different style of creating a visitor experience than uh, you would see in some other places. Um, da, 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 tasty, tasty, tasty. Um, this is data that's a little bit old and the number is nebulous anyways, but if you're talking about Yellowstone, 10 years ago, we were down to about 2,700 animals. That number fluctuates between a low of about 2,500 and a high of about 4,000. The naturalist, the bison management staff and the whole fish and wild and all the other good people involved believe that the two, three million acres of Yellowstone National Park had a carrying capacity of about 4,000 bison. So the question is, what happens when you go over that number? Number one, people scream and yell. Number two, people scream and yell. <laughs> number three, the park staff has to make tough, tough, tough decisions. They work on with the interagency inter bison management team, which is now comprised of as many tribal leaders and tribal elders and staff as anybody else. The plan right and, and bison, the herd in Yellowstone National Park is naturally, there are two herds and they naturally migrate. One goes out West Yellowstone up into the uh, Horses Butte area. And the other is the Lamar Valley. Um, Heard, and they wander out of the park right through Gardner. There's a bridge in Gardner, so hey, we're going to walk right over the bridge and take our way up to Jim Yankee, Yankee Jim Canyon and some other places. Bison have the ability to carry a disease called brucellosis. Cows can get brucellosis. Elk always get brucellosis. And so because Montana and uh, the bison in Yellowstone are primarily in the north, two sections of it, there is a herd down in Teton that's a more of a managed herd. Um, but the northern uh, herds go out onto the, they want, they don't read the signs. They don't <laughs> care that it's in the Yellowstone National Park boundary. They just wander out and go off they go. And the ranchers in those areas, and that's how Montana and Wyoming sustains their sustains themselves and us is through ranching. And the bison go up and they see the cows and they talk to each other and they do things. And the ranchers are 100% convinced, 98% convinced <laughs> that they're, that the bison from Yellowstone National Park are gonna transmit brucellosis to their cows. Zero, never, ever, ever. Are there any documented cases of Bison to cow brucellosis transmission. 
Zero. None. Zip How does it transmit? It transmits. I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. Elk are the number one transmitters because elk get brucellosis, and brucellosis is transmitted through the amniotic after birth stuff that's left over after a, a bison or an elk or another infected animal gets brucellosis, and the journeys are living in the, the after birth stuff, and the cows come over and they lick it, and then, you know, animals tend to get recycle those nutrients, and what's left, other things try to recycle on. So the only way you can transmit it is number one, be by a calf and who, a, a cow that has just given birth, and the mamas aren't there to beat the snot out of you when you try to get near her cows, her babies, her little red dogs, and get to that placenta on the other left of the parts. Elk drop their calves, walk away, and off they go, leaving much a much greater uh, stuff piles laying around, and there's more elk anyways. So brucellosis transmission is primarily done through elk. No, I don't hear any ranchers in Wyoming or Montana saying we should cut the elk herd because elk ranching is huge in Montana and Wyoming. Huge. Very, it's a money maker. It helps, it sustains, it helps sustain herds. And natural culling is a thing that happens. So back to Yellowstone's herd, when they leave the park, Montana has a very limited season on bison who leave the park. However, getting a permit is a, a crapshoot. Um, it's very difficult. And we have arrangements with native tribes to have tribal hunt times. And most of those guys are out there with bow and arrow. A lot of them hunt with firearms. But a lot of guys are out there trying it still with bow and arrow, uh, which is if you think about bison hide is this thick. You know, that's that's really that's that's skillful right there. Um, and so they walk up to these places outside the park, and for a while there was sort of a knee jerk reaction to this brucellosis thing. So the knee jerk reaction was that Yellowstone would. Um, Call off way low. They call their numbers down to that 2,500, 2,000 mark by um, capturing the animals. We have two holding, two big ranch holding facilities. We capture the animals there and um, check them for brucellosis. They check them for DNA. They check them for this. They check them for that and um, send them to slaughter. However, they didn't get eaten, they were simply slaughtered. That's a waste, that's ridiculous. So that, that plan didn't last very long, that was a stupid plan. So now the, the strongest plan is limited hunting in Montana. I don't think Wyoming has a season, but don't quote me on that. Um, and tribal hunts, which are good for everybody. And um, Many of the animals that are captured are sent to a holding facility, Stevens Creek holding facility, and they have to wait two years to prove they don't have brucellosis because it can prevent. Of course, it's only going to be cows that are quarantined. Bulls can't transmit it, so they can go about their merry way. Um, but the cows are quarantined, and when it's determined that the quarantine time is up, it was two years, it could be less, it could be more now. Now we're uh, taking those animals back to the tribes all over the United States and in pretty significant numbers, hoping to enrich the gene pool in all those uh, tribes, or all tribes, all those uh, herds that are around the United States, some of which came from Texas, some of which came from the Bronx Zoo. There's a great story for you right there, but it came from Yellowstone. So it's <laughs> um, and so that's a, to me, Personally, that seems like a win-win. That puts the bison, and then the Native American tribes can either. There's originally they had to use the bison that were given to them by the National Park Service for tribal reasons only, but we had so many bison to give to them because bison are pretty, pretty um profound. They're, um they 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 drop babies left and right, and a lot of a lot of twins. Um, a, a mama can do it consecutive years. So they're trying to, um, the 
change the rules for the tri how tribes can use the animals. So they, of course, distribute them amongst themselves, the meat, the tribes, and the, uh, the ritualistic things that they need. And many tribes have been given permission to sell to the public. If you want bison meat or hide, try a tribe. Yes, sir. Do they have an actual predator on this No. Yes, they do. Oh. You ever see wolves take down a there? I one of the reasons I didn't bring any pictures tonight is just Google bison on your phone. Thousands and thousands and thousands of things. Um and wolf, if you can find a video of a, of a wolf pack taking down a bison, it's pretty spectacular. It's pretty spectacular. The coordinated effort of the wolves and then the ravens are over here going, yeah, baby. And the coyotes are sitting over here slobbering going, ooh, we're having dinner tonight. Um, it, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Yes, sir. So how did the herd stay genetically pure if they're wandering in Montana and Wyoming and interacting with they're cows? Not, okay. They're not interacting with cows. That's yeah. the, like the great American myth that the the beef producers have said, your bison are screwing up my beef. Okay. Well, excuse me, maybe <laughs> your beef are screwing up my bison. Um, it's uh, um, It's just, it's not happening. It's just not happening. They're staying genetically pure out there playing with the in the wilds of Montana. Montana is also pushed um, one of the best ways for saving a species, and we know that around here in our area, is to buy land and get the rights, buy the, buy the rights to that land so they can't bring in more ranchers, they can't bring in more of this or that. And that's there's a lot more property. The Nature Conservancy, um, state of Montana, uh, Fish and Wild have been buying property outside the edges of Yellowstone to make that to no hunting zone because it's not your property. So that's one of the ways that it's um, helping the situation. But the whole myth about um, when you when you look back, the beef and bison mating is not usually that successful. Um, babies are malformed or there's not the right this or that or the other thing. So it's not a hugely, it's not a thing that's gonna happen a lot. Happened enough because when you go from six million bison, eight million bison in the United States down to hundred in four or five different herds, you're going to do anything you can to try to get those bison back. Um, absolutely unbelievable the the story of how bison came came back. So the park, Yellowstone manages a herd of about 4,000-ish. Uh, by the way, a young man who went to Central Catholic is now the chief bison uh, staff scientist at Yellowstone National Park. So I'm thinking we need to call him home and do it cheap and make him stay at his parents' house or with some high school buddies. I've got some people in mind. Um, what else have I got on here? Marianne, uh -huh. um, is Bruce Wilson's like one of those like CWD chronic wasting disease in deer was captive herds and fenced in herds. Does it also spread that way more than it doesn't go from the feeding and you know being living in their own waste? If if you have a herd of bison that has brucellosis confirmed, then you need to quarantine the whole thing or slaughter them right right now. If you are a rancher and you get one cow and you're heard of brucellosis, you have <laughs> shut down everything right here, right now. It's very dangerous. It's very expensive if your herd gets it. So of course the ranchers are concerned. It only takes one cow, one thing of your seven, eight hundred, five thousand 5,000 head of cattle, one test of brucellosis and you're done for. That's, that's brutal if you're trying to make a living Providing my hamburger, and I'm glad they provide my hamburger. Then it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. But it's, um, it's not. It's like if a bison has it and drops a, a baby, and other mama comes over and licks on the placenta, mama could certainly get it. Absolutely, it's, it's placenta transmission, and so mama has to come over and eat somebody else's placenta. And of course, that happens. And, if you're out there and it's snowing and there's 15 feet of snow and, you're, and it's it's May and you think you're going to get a meal and a snowstorm comes up, you're going to eat what's available. 
Why is it dangerous to have it? Why is it dangerous to have it in meat? It does really ugly things to you. It's, I don't know exactly what you would happen if you ate tainted meat, but the less I knew about brucellosis, the happier I was, because it was like, mm, maybe I will stop being an omnivore. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it's deadly. It's deadly in, in cattle. It's deadly and eventually deadly in bison. And it's one, it's, it reminds me of trichinosis. It's, it reminds me more of a, like a trichinosis thing that, that pork gets, pigs get. I think it's, I'm not a, you know, that's not my area of expertise, but it's, it's ugly if, if the animals get it. And your whole herd has to be gone. Not, not slaughtered for consumption, slaughtered, gone. It, it's a really, it's a, it's a death knell for a rancher if they get it. Um, how many of you have been to Yellowstone? Who's been in a bison jam? Oh, yes. People would come to the ranger station all the time. It's every day. Somebody would come to the ranger station. Where's the bison today? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. I'm in West Yellowstone, and the last I saw them, they were laying in my backyard under the, under the, under the, uh, well, when we lived in North Dakota, they'd come in the backyard, and I'd hang my white sheets out on the line to dry, and they'd rub their noses right behind <laughs> my white sheets. Wash them again. Um, all sorts of things that they can do. Um, so when people say, Where are the bison today? We'd say, Do you have to be someplace in like the next two hours? Oh, yeah, we've got dinner reservations at the lot. That's where they're going to be on then. Yeah. I can guarantee if you need to be somewhere in a hurry, that's where the bison are going to be. No. Um, because they are migrating herds in the spring, they'll come up the Madison River. Um, we would we did programs in the campground at the amphitheater there, and there were days when we were like, ah, the program is canceled. We have a bison problem. We're not, I'm not going down there with the bison. And people said, oh, we can sit on the benches. We'll be fine. I'm going, no. Tom and I, one time, remember, think big dumb animal that weighs 2,000 pounds. Here's the bison. If you're late for a very expensive dinner reservation that you had to order nine months in a year. <laughs> Here's a bison on other occasions. Tom and I were, uh, we lived in what's called the Camp Dunder Cabin in Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And this is our first big time experience with bison. And we're looking over into so it's where about that table is right there. And there's a mama bison and some other bison and they're standing here grazing, grazing. I swear to God, we watched this. And Tom and I are standing next to each other and he said, did, did you see that? And I said, did, did you see a bison just go up all four feet off the ground, did a 180 in there and back, land back on and says, that's what I saw. I said, well, if you saw it, I saw it. But if you didn't see it, I didn't see it. Um, agile, incredibly agile. They can climb up, you know, at 35 miles an hour, they can climb up ridges and buttes and all over. Um, when we lived at Theodore Roosevelt, we had a, um, there was a horse riding concession there, a really wonderful family. And an eight foot fence to keep their horses safe. They come out one morning and one of their horses is back hot, is ripped from knee to knee to butt, knee to tail, because a bison, a bull, had jumped over that eight foot fence into the big riding arena, bashed the horse up, and then was still able inside this arena to get enough distance to get back up and over that eight foot fence. And people are in their cars going, oh, it's not going to be fun. No, no, don't, don't, don't do it. Um, and there's thousands of videos on YouTube about people doing bad things with big dumb bison. They'll do it. So if you want to know where the bison are in the spring in uh, in the Madison River Valley, and then they go up and over what's called Mary Mountain to the central part of the park, the, the northern herd, which is the Lamar Valley herd, uh, comes down uh, through Gardner, right through Gardner. Uh, the Roosevelt Arch, and then back and populates the Lamar Valley. Not much interaction between those two herds, surprisingly small amount, even between those two herds that are only, you know, 50 miles away as the crow flies. Um, but they like to walk on the roads, so that's a lot yeah. longer. That takes a lot longer. Um, the, I got one more bison. I, I forgot to I charged my watch and forgot to put it on. I told you I could do this for hours. I got, got one more great story. So let's see, which is one more great story? 
So when I was at Theodore Roosevelt on Sunday mornings, I would polish my, I'd go outside to the picnic table, polish my boots and get all ready for the week. And I'm looking over and we lived in the campground. Tom was a camp tender. So from here to the parking lot, maybe, I see this commotion of bison in a herd just swirling around and around and around. And I hear people yelling, yeah, the dog barking and looking over and I'm like, what the heck? So what I ended up seeing, what I realized I was looking at was a golden retriever trying to herd up on oh, <laughs> 40 bison. <laughs> and it was doing a pretty good job. The bison were going in this big circle and going around. The mom of the of the animal, of the dog, is on the other side, and the kids are watching. I'm over here yelling, step away from the bison at the top of my lungs, and she couldn't hear, so I went back in and got my hat on, figuring maybe from a distance, you could tell I was just not some squirrely lady, but the ranger was up, and I'm yelling, and I'm not getting any closer, man. I am not going any, uh, no. So this bison herd is doing this, and the dog is yapping, and there's another guy over in another tent pretty close to the melee, who's calmly taking his metal tent stakes and chucking them into the back of his van. Ka-clank, <laughs> ka-clank, and I'm going, Buster, get in your car right now. And by now, a crowd is is gathering, and I'm trying to get people to go away. So I make a call on the radio that we've got a, a bison versus dog issue at the campground. And in Medora, North Dakota, if you use your park radio, Everybody in about a 10 county radius hears it. So here's Marianne. Uh, 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 we, we got the dog and the, 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 the bison. And the, 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 I'm just battling. I'm just mortified. So finally, and I finally got the lady's attention and I yelled, Go back to your car. And she finally gets it. And this is what I saw. walking away and I honest to God thought I was going to see a golden retriever but what do you think that good little puppy dog did when mama walked away I followed her right back you know it was there's a reason your dog has to be on a leash in the national parks I don't care where you're, how good your dog is it still has to be on a leash and um, when the ranger showed up, you can never find a ranger in the wall. When, it comes <laughs> um, when the ranger showed up, and I, I've said this about Tom and all the other rangers he's worked with, there's happy go lucky rangers, and then there's pop face on the ranger. Their demeanor changes. They're, they're, they know that they've got a loaded sidearm, and they might have to do something different. They go into cop mode. And this young ranger pulled up, and we, I looked at him, and he was totally in cop mode. Because unbeknownst to me, when the superintendent heard me going, dog, but 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 bison, dog, bison, problem. She called the ranger and told the ranger to shoot the dog. She is one of the most dog-loving people I've ever met in my life. And yet the resource comes first. And I was never so happy to see a dog walk away. Fast forward to later that afternoon, my boots are polished. I'm doing a program up front, bison jeopardy. And these two little kids and their dad come up, and <clears throat> I'm still shaking up all this later. And I started to cry. Oh, I said, you should. Oh, my gosh, this morning we had a real scary incident. It could have been. And the little kids going, yeah, that was my mother. And you were going, oh, oh, okay. And the dad's there, and he did say, we have never been so happy to get a ticket in our lives. Because we thought we were going to leave our, our dog there. And I said, so it, it's. Don't play with bison. Just don't do it. Um, just don't do it. They're um, amazing. They're fabulous. They're the coolest things on the planet. But maybe, just maybe, my number one most favorite thing about bison is that they are on the National Park Ranger badge. They are on the emblem of the Department of the Interior. This is a story of where we as white settlers pretty nearly screwed it up a hundred percent pretty nearly and yet now because we've wised up we've partnered with the right people and in the right places we've made hard decisions about what dog that's on vacation with its family or do i tend to the resource do we worry about ranchers who have bisolosis concerns do we 
What do we do with our herd to make it all work? We're making better decisions. We're making stronger science-based decisions. And that's the most important thing about bison, um, about knowing anything about bison at all. So that's my top 10 list of over seven things because that was over an hour of Marianne Bentley. Um, another program I did with kids is called Bison Jeopardy. And um, for the lucky few that were paying attention who have not nodded off, if you can answer some of these questions, if you can question some of these answers, I have for you official bully bison books. <laughs> bully bison books. Um, I've had more than one visitor say, can we take this and get ice cream home with it? I said, oh, go ahead and try. <laughs> um, work. You might find somebody behind the desk, behind the counter, who's willing to give a kid an ice cream cone. So um, what I learned playing games with, um, I, I do a game called Who Wants to Be a Wolf Watcher? Um, most of the stuff I do with kids is in a form of something because I want the kids to play with me. I want them to answer questions. So I found out doing Jeopardy after a long time that I need, we have to do the questions in order because otherwise it's just not funny. So um, um, let's see. Uh, first of all, I need a hostess. Oh, birthday boy, could you come up, please? <laughs> Round of applause for Van of White. You can I'll, I'll, I'll hold it up. Uh, many years, 10, 15 years usually. You got to sit in the chair, Van. Oh, you have to sit down, old, Van. Right. Old. No, no, you don't. You sort of get to me. So we have three categories tonight and um, Bully Bison Bucks. They're all the same denomination because it got too complicated. Trying to keep that. Um, question number one. You're, you're, yeah, I'm going to pick the categories. Um, Native American uses for bison for $100. Don't forget to ask in a form of a form of a. You have to ask the question, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm a Jeopardy for long time. Here's the answer. Your final Jeopardy, your Jeopardy answer is a fly swatter. So your question is going to be What is a good use for buffalo hide? Bison hide. Closer. Bison <laughs> hide. Uh, Native Americans will take a use, literally take a bison, use it for a fly spotter. They're pretty cool. I want to get one of those too. Um, question, next question. Are you ready? The answer is a spoon. That's you, yeah. Where's what can you use? Where is it? Yes, bingo. There we go. There we go. What can you use bison one for? Or hooves, they they work out pretty well. Bison horn, a buffalo, that's fine. Um, victim number three, ready? Oh, that's two. A sleeping bag. Oh, don't strain yourself too hard here. <laughs> what can you use a bison hide for? Absolutely, very nice, very nice. Those were the easy questions. Now we're going to get into the hard stuff. Back here, ready? Uh, the two hundred, hundred dollar question. Size matters. About forty pounds. The answer is about forty pounds. The question is. Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Little red dogs. They're so cute. How many of you saw the news reports and the videos of a visitor at Yellowstone putting a baby bison in the back of his car oh, because it was all by itself? <laughs> They got arrested. Oh yeah, fine. They got fine. <laughs> they got fine for harassing the wildlife. I was in a situation once where there's a little red dog just standing in the road going. Three million visitors a year on this road, and it's out there going. Oh. So Danny and I, my younger son and I, did go down and convince it to go into the woods, and eventually it'll find its parents. But you never know. Okay, we're still on size matters. Um, Mr. Dr. Morrow, he's been. To, I'll tell another story about the dogs. You ready? Your answer is. About a thousand pounds. What's half the bison? That's very <laughs> cool. Teenage bison. Teenage bison. Teenage bison. <laughs> Smart out. Um, some females can be as low as a, a young female might be a thousand. Twelve hundred is is more the average. Okay, we're still on size manners. Um, ready? About two thousand pounds. The <laughs> female. Yeah. What does a male? Do? What does a male? Do? <laughs> male bison. 
2,000 pounds is, is a good number. Or you, okay, or another answer could be a uh, Dodge pickup. You know, that would have been an acceptable answer. I would have taken that. Okay, lots of bison. Last category, Mr. Cullen, you ready? Here's your answer. Sure. About 3,900 bison. I'll be Ish. Right, about 39 ish. 39 to 4,000 ish. Use that in good health. Don't spend it all in one place. Um, and my, again, this is Yellowstone. Who wants to take a crack at whoever I bothered over here? You ready? I'm ready. Um, about 2,500 bison. And this number has actually gone up now. What would be the uh, target number of bison to be managed in Yellowstone? Pretend you're 10 years old. <laughs> Oh. And just 25, 2,500 bison, quarter of a million bison. What would be a large herd? 250,000. Don't listen to the lady up here. <laughs> Try something along, and it's actually more than this, it's about 400,000 now. Total number of bison in North America. Or the world. Oh, yes. It can be in the world or in North America. So, Bully Bison book. There you go. Um, who wants the second to last question? Because we are going to play Final Jeopardy. Who wants the second to last? Let's see. Um, Karen, do you think you can handle this one? Okay, okay Karen. I know it's a lot. <laughs> the Final Jeopardy answer is about 25 bison. Yeah. Hmm. How many bison were there when? The lowest point of bison? No, but that, I like the way you're thinking. I was in Yellowstone National Park when I did this program. How many bison were there when? When Yellowstone. This one. When Yellowstone became a national park. 25 bison. From 6 million in North America to 100 spread out through the United States. And 25 in Yellowstone. If they only had 25, um, that inbreeding, doesn't that seem like that would really affect their health? Apparently not. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and there were, the, the Yellowstone herd itself was not monkeyed with. They did bring some animals back in other places. So there's, so the genetic inbreeding doesn't happen. Um, and that's a long, complicated story. Um, so it's, uh, um, it just, what's, thank you. What's the ratio of male to female? I don't know, but there's um, more females. Um, and you'll have uh, like elk have harems and all that. Um, a bison, uh, if you've not seen the rut, oh my gosh, the rut is a blast. Um, <laughs> two thousand, take two Dodge pickup trucks, slam it into each other as hard as they can, trying to roll on one down the hill and up. It, it's, you got to see the, the bison rut. Winner takes all. And um, yeah, for the yeah, it's a it's a spectacular, and that's August, by the way. If you want to go see it, it's early August. So get your tickets now. Okay. Okay. Final Jeopardy. Hmm. Okay, here's a hard one. Okay, who wants who wants to try it? Any takers? Okay. Try it. Okay. Try it. What is Ranger Anna's favorite animal? Oh, no, it's Ranger. Bison. Yeah, bison. <laughs> Uh, she has bully books. They're completely and utterly useless. Round of applause for Vanna White. What a nice. Um, seriously, what intelligent questions do you have after a round of, of bison jeopardy? All right. Have we used bison like the Chinese have used the panda by putting a few of them in different countries? And that's what the, the new intertribal arrangement is to get that Yellowstone genetic diversity, some over there, some over there, and then there's other trading within the tribal regions. I'm talking about who we have to send some to China. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Am I? I don't know. I would assume. Okay. Where do bison, where do bison come from originally? The poor Yellowstone National Park. Where in Eurasia? Russia. Russia. In the steppes of Russia, there's an animal still there today called zubra. Um, 
and it's a Vishnet, depending on how your Polish version goes. And it's in the steppes and the forests of Poland. I so want to go. Um, don't have anybody. Don't have. That's not gonna happen. But if I were to go someplace, not in the United States, I'd want to go to the Polish forest to see the other bison. Started there, came over the land bridge uh, in the form of bison latifrons, which is pre, you know, a zillion years ago. Bison uh, wingspan. I have a five foot wingspan. Uh, bison latifrons would have a horn span of 10, 8, 10, 12 feet. And they stuck straight out. And if you're living in a prehistoric swamp, boy, that's a great survival technique right there. That's an adaption that's that's pretty amazing. Eventually, bison latifrons, zebra, bison bison here in the United States. Huh. And then what's bison in Poland now or Poland? They're doing well. They're they're what's, they're protected. It's still zebra. Okay. Still uh Visionet. W I S. And continent, continent, continent. Where's Brian? He's just going to need a. What's um, the species? They're they're um. Are they bison? They're bison. Okay. They're they are bison. Um, and our bison descended from those bison. Okay. Not the water bison. 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 they I don't I don't think they're called bison bison. It's some bison. species. It's because my Polish stinks. <laughs> so it's something in Polish Polish or Latin Latin. Um, anybody get? Come on, everybody, pull out your smartphones. Look it up. Um, <laughs> you think we can we get those? We have a question from Paul okay. on Zoom. Hi, Paul. Is Metro Parks Toledo eventually oh. going to have bison like oh. uh, Tell Darby Creek Metro Park near Columbus has instead of cattle at oak openings? Oh, are bison better grazers for Northwest Ohio native plants? So I'm going to cop out on an answer to that one next month. Tim Shutter, Dr. Shutter from Chief of Metro Parks um, Natural, Resources. Natural Resources Division is going to be our speaker. He wants to talk about uh, conifer changes. I want to talk about bison, of course. I live on the corner near the cows. You know, it's. I think it was a nice effort. I don't know. I'm not a herbaceous ecologist. But we're going to ask Dr. Shutter those questions next month. So, be, and it will be at C4, right? And yeah, he's talking Saturday about his, uh, his track. His PCT track. Yeah, I yes. Pacific Crest track. Right. Yeah, so let's wait and bombard him when he gets here. We'll, we'll ask him the bison questions when he gets Because we all pretty much know the answers to the conifer removal question. That's where we, most of us have comfortable with that, but the whole bison thing and, and the cows just grazing is a whole interesting. I'll throw in a couple of two cents about parks and bison birds. The big issue I understand is the fence. Yeah. It oh, yeah. Them. It's not that they can't get the bison, but these fences cost a fortune. As Mary had talked about them jumping over an eight foot fence yep. and the size and the strength of the fence that you have to have to contain them because obviously it's astronomical. If you see what they use to contain the cattle, it opens up with a couple yeah. of electric wires. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but a cow has a high this thick. A bison has a high that thick, and it's they'll they'll jump those fences in a heartbeat. So I do have a question also about the woodland bison. The, the how, Canadian bison. Yeah. How closely are we? They are the same. And do they interact at all? Yeah. So the question is, what's what's the relationship between north between United States bison and bison in Canada, very often referred to as wood bison. This essentially they tend to be, they're still bison bison. They tend to be smaller animals because they have less resource to choose from. They have less crappy grass to graze on, but they're still bison bison. Uh, called woods bison, sometimes called woodland bison. It's the same critter. So they're almost like a subspecies. Um, some people want to, some biologists will call it a subspecies, some will not. Pick a biologist and go with that story. Okay. So it's sort of like brown bears, Kodiak bear. Is it a grizzly bear, Kodiak bear? You know, yeah, same, same kind of deal. Bison here in North America are bison, bison, bison. And those bison might be bison, bison. Hey, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's just one I don't want to. <laughs> yes. So you have said that we're managing based on science base. 
if Mary Ann had her way to manage the bison herd in the continental U.S., what would you do differently than we're doing now? I am in the camp that believes much of North Dakota, South Dakota, Northern Minnesota, Northern Wyoming, Northern Montana should be free range and if bison are there, so be it. There was a concept called the Buffalo Commons where get rid of the state of North Dakota, get rid of the state of South Dakota, get rid of Northern Montana and turn it back to the bison and just pull out, pull everybody else out. <laughs> Okay, well, I like practical know, solutions. Most practical solutions, but um, understanding and, and the fencing issue is huge. I mean, uh, Yellow, uh, Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt National Park is the only national park in the country that has a fence around it. It's one lousy strand of barbed wire because we had to fence it uh, against bison leaving and getting into North Dakota beef. So, um, you know, it's 56, almost six. 60,000 acres with one fence around it. And it's it was part of the agreement uh, North Dakota made with the federal government to have bison brought back to North Dakota. So they got fire feral horses up there too that are maybe a bigger, I, like I said, I've got like about 10,000 more bison stories. Um, for beer, I'll tell bison stories all night long, but we do want to get you going. It might be snowing. Our, our folks on Facebook, thanks for sticking with us. I'm sorry I did this all night, dodge and weave, but like I said, I'm standing in front of a lectern, A, you can't see me, and B, not my style. So, all right, I can see you all. <laughs> Did you find the videos, Elliot?